Good morning, Life Point Church. So good to see everyone here. Can we stand to our feet as we start our worship service out with musical worship? We praise the King of Kings, the Almighty, the Creator of the universe. So glad you could join us in today's service. Let's lift our voice. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. So from heaven, you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born and then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Oh, oh, oh. We sing praise. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the
God is my victory and he is he. circumstance we sing it all of my life in every season yes, you are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship yes I do we sing that I have a reason to worship come to worship you, Jesus. Yes, I have a reason to worship. While we repeat, while we repeat the simple phrase, I want to encourage you, church. I want to encourage you, church, to just think on this lyrics. We have reason to worship. We have reason to come before the Almighty and give Him thanks. Yes, because He is worthy of it. Yes, because he's given us eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. Many of you have your own story to sing this. I have a reason to worship. So I want you to look back, and I want you to remind your soul, remind your heart why you have a reason to worship. I don't know what it is, but you have a reason to worship. I'm going to read from Psalms 103. I love David's language here. He writes so many reasons why we worship our Savior. He forgives my sins and he heals my diseases. I have a reason to worship. He redeemed my life from the pit, from destruction. I have a reason to worship. He crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. I have a reason to worship. Oh, he's gracious, he's merciful, slow to linger. I have a reason to worship. Oh, yes. I have a reason to worship. So I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. Because you alone I long to worship. Yes, you alone are worthy of my praise. 
sing it again. And I will give you all my worship. I will give you my praise. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my worship. Sing it, church. I will give you all my worship. You alone. And you alone. I long to worship. You our faith. This is what we declare this morning. Father, be glorified in our song. Come on, church, with confidence, we sing this out together. One voice. And I believe that Christ is my Savior. All for love, he plundered my heart from the grave. This is the simple gospel, just like that. I believe that Christ is Redeemer. Oh, for love, He set up the payment of sin. This is the simple gospel. It will never ever change. Let the church say amen, let the church say amen, death is defeated, Jesus is risen, this is our faith, the good news of grace, oh let the church
Thank you, worship team. Pray with me. Lord, we do ask that these things would be so. We say amen. We say amen. We are here to worship because you are good and you have brought redemption through your son, Jesus. So Lord, receive our sacrifice of praise today. May it be pleasing to you. And all of God's people together said, amen. Amen. You may all be seated, kids. You're going to go in a minute, but I need your help for something really important first. Everyone, you can have a seat. Now, I'm going to ask, we've got, well, first of all, my name's Wes. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's just such an exciting week coming up that I, I forgot to introduce myself. But we've got a great thing happening this week, and in the house, we have a bunch of folks who are making VBS happen. And so I want to ask right now, kids, you need to be here, so the kids stay seated. I'm going to have your help in a minute. If you are one of the VBS servants this week, would you please stand up? We've got a lot of you. We've got over 60 folks. Give them a round of applause. It is going to be an awesome week. And kids, we wanted you to be here. No, 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 no. You got to stay standing. No, don't sit down yet. Thank you. I appreciate that, but stay. Kids, we need your help. And so we're going to bless all of those folks who are making VBS happen for you and for the Lord. And so on the count of three, I'd like all the kids in the room. Now this, you guys have some voices, kids? Okay, all right. This is your chance to holler in church. I want you as loud as you can to say, thank you. Ready? One, two, three. Awesome. Okay, now stay standing. I also have a scripture for you. I want you guys to listen. This is a passage I've been praying for this team and thinking about for this team. It's going to be an awesome week. It's going to be like over 90 degrees every day, and we've got like 1.3 million kids coming, and it's going to be some energy, and the gospel is going, and we are so excited. So workers, servants for VBS, listen to this blessing. This is from Isaiah chapter 40, starting at verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths and kids shall grow faint and weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Holy Father, I pray a blessing on these servants this week. They are bearers of your good news to the hearts of the children in our community and beyond. And I pray that they would know the strength that comes from waiting upon you. I pray that they would know the endurance that comes from you, O oh Lord, because you do not grow faint or grow weary. I pray that they would have a week that is filled with the power and the strength that comes from your mighty spirit at work in them. Give them opportunities to display the gospel, to speak the gospel, to show the gospel. Give them opportunities to let all of our kids know just how much they are loved because they are made in your image. So Lord, I pray this blessing upon these servants today, and I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus our Lord. And God's people said, amen, amen. Servants, you may have a seat. Kids, thank you for helping us bless these folks. You may head back. The spinny pinwheel is back there. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be an awesome week. We are so excited. We are so excited. So head on back. We are excited about VBS coming this week, and we're excited to be God's people and belong together in worship this morning. I'm so happy that you're here. Livestream folks, we love that you get to join us, and we're glad that you are tuning in today, and we are grateful to be together here for worship. 
worship. We are going to continue today in worship as we continue in our new sermon series in the book of Philippians. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have one of these study guides, raise your hand in the air right now. You probably need it to fan yourself. It's a warm day. We would love to put one in your hands. If you need one, stick your hand up. We've got one down here. If you're online, you can find this online. You can download the digital copy and print that out. This is important. You'll need it today. Uh, yeah, stick your hand up in the air. The ushers have them. They will come give them to you. We want to put this in your hands. This is a great resource. It is a great way for you to prepare for Sunday morning. Find an hour during the week. Maybe it's on Saturday. We call it the Saturday Soak, where you can be prepared in what is coming up on Sunday as we study through the book of Philippians. Pastor Zach, a member of our preaching team, is up today. We're excited about what God is doing in his people here through the ministry of his word. So I want to invite you to, to dive in on that. Uh, we also want you to know that, that when we gather for worship here, it is, it is a celebration because of the good things that God has done. And I want to know how we can be praying for all of you. So if you are not new here and you've been here for a long time, fill this card out. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Drop this in the black offering boxes at the back of the room. If you're online, you can fill it out at sharethelife.org. If you're a guest with us, we would love to know that you were here. We'd love to know how we can help answer your questions and get you connected, and so you can fill this out as well. Uh, we have the opportunity to worship those of us who call this place home through giving, and thank you, because church, you display the generosity of God, and it is awesome to see that. So thank you for that. Uh, giving opportunities are at the, the black boxes in the back of the room and at sharethelife.org slash give. There's a special giving opportunity going right now, but it wraps up next week. And this is the annual baby bottle campaign through our partners, our ministry partners at the, the Alpha Center. And the Alpha Center provides awesome, awesome care for women who find themselves in, in pregnancies, often crisis pregnancies, both women and men who, who, who are dealing with all of these things. They provide great medical care. They provide great gospel care, and they are a treasured ministry partner of ours. This campaign makes up a significant portion of their annual budget, so I want to encourage you to fill those baby bottles up with gold coins and large checks and return them here. You can set them on the black boxes or at the Welcome Center or return them to the office. If you miss the box, you can scan that and you can participate virtually and send digital money that is just as real as the other stuff that's in the bottle. So you can do that. We invite you to participate in that. It wraps up next week on Father's Day. So please, if you've got one of those at home, be sure to bring it back. We also have an opportunity, if you've been checking things out and you're interested in learning what it means to belong in membership here at LifePoint, today is a membership class in the Fireside Room. It goes from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. There's lunch provided in there. One of our pastors, Craig, leads us through that. We're excited about that. Even if you didn't sign up ahead of time, we're ready for you. So you should come and learn what it means to belong in membership here. This doesn't obligate you to membership. It simply lets you know what it means. So we would encourage you in that. And finally, maybe you've been like wanting to help out with VBS, didn't know how, but you've got some extra time today. You could run to the store and grab some Otter Pops or some bunch of balloons like you see on the screen. You could also, after the second community life hour, after the 11 o'clock hour, run and grab a quick bite to eat and come back here. It's all hands on deck. We are transforming this place into Australia. So if you've got time at 1230 and want to arrive here at 1230, you can find Jerry and the team in the elementary room. They could use any hands that are available to help transform this place in decorating. It's a one-time serve opportunity. Just show up. We'd love to have you. We would love for you to be here. So that's what's happening right now. And next, we are privileged to have the Word of God open and read for us. Would you please stand for God's Word? Good morning. I'm Scott Kramer. I've been attending here about eight years. And recently, uh, I've been involved in a parenting class where we have been seeking to edify and encourage parents in the awesome responsibility of raising the children God has given them. Our passage this morning is from page 980 in the Pew Bible, the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, 
always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is God's word. Please be seated. It's awesome. Thank you, Scott. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I'm a part of our preaching team. Delighted to be with you today. We're in week two of a series through the book of Philippians. We're going to cover the whole thing this summer. And Dale, one of our pastors, part of the preaching team, kicked off last week and opened this um, incredible letter, and I'm so thankful for that. He mentioned a couple of our goals for the series, and I want to reiterate those now. We have two goals. Uh, the first goal for this series is that we would grow in our love, in our knowing of Jesus. That's our target. We want to know him more, deeper, and love him more. And uh, I'm already grateful for that. Wasn't it, wasn't it just wonderful to show up to church to hear other people sing of that love with affection in their tone? And I'm just so grateful for John and the, the worship team. Thank you guys for leading us. That's hard to do. That's really hard to do. To take us from the minivan, yeah, yeah. You were bickering with your spouse on the way in and, and John got us to the throne of Jesus. So that's a long journey, right? <laughs> and he does that skillfully. So thank you for your, your work. To know Christ, that's what we're doing. Even as we gather, as we worship. But there's a second goal in this series. It's a subtle one. We wanna grow deeper in our understanding of how to study the Bible for ourselves not as an end in itself. That goal is a means to the first goal. So study is never the point. <laughs> you, don't, you don't wear glasses to get smarter. You're studying the Bible to know Christ and enjoy him and love him more. That's our aim. So in this, in this uh, sermon, I'm gonna try to do this. This is early in the series and you've got this resource. I hope everybody has this resource in your hand. Make sure you're open to the text and then you've got a place for notes from the sermon, but you've, you're gonna have a pen today. And I wanna just illustrate through the sermon ways that you can use this resource, circle and underline. That's coming, I warned you, I warned you. These are our goals for the series and we're walking through the, the book of Philippians. Last week we got introduced to this letter. We know who wrote it, this is Paul writing. He's writing to a group of Christians that he planted this church about 10 years ago in a Roman colony called Philippi. These are young believers in the faith, and that's all interesting, but for today's text, what's most interesting is not who wrote it or to whom. What's most interesting is from where he wrote it. From where? And we know from the book of Philippians that Paul is actually writing from prison. He's in prison. And it's funny, if you look at scholars, this guy, we're talking about the Apostle Paul, he's been in prison so much that there's a little debate about which imprisonment it is. Think about that kind of track record. Yeah, wait, if somebody's like, uh, did you write from prison? And you go, yeah, which one? I can't remember. Was it in Ephesus? Or, yeah, there's so many. <laughs> Most scholars, though, agree there's, there's a lot of good evidence. This is probably his Roman imprisonment, especially with the dating of the letter between 60 and 62 AD. On his way to prison, he's been shipwrecked. Uh, he's nearly died. He spent the winter on some island, and he got bit by a poisonous snake. It's been rough so far. And then he finishes off that journey in Rome. He finally makes it to the big city. This is like New York, this awesome city, and he's in prison. It's probably house arrest, but it's not as nice as it sounds. Uh, he's probably chained to a Roman guard. He can have visitors, but he's awaiting trial. And prison back then, 
um, in the ancient world, prison wasn't like a common way to punish someone for a crime. The easier way to punish them was to kill them. That's actually a lot easier. So, so being in prison is kind of just waiting. <laughs> and in fact, that's the situation Paul finds himself in. He's on house arrest. He's going to be going on trial. He will likely die. This is death row. And he writes a letter. What kind of letter would you write if you were in prison on death row? Who would you write to in your life, personally? Imagine it. What kind of letter would you write? To whom would you write? Here's my guess. Most people in prison on death row don't write fluffy letters. That's my guess. <laughs> when, when life gets real narrow and focused and you're about to die, you're probably not writing a poem that you've always thought, I'd like to get into poetry. You know, it, you're probably not like, oh my gosh, I wanted to write that fictional novel, so let me just take that up as a hobby. No, there's, there's other forms of literature he could have used, but he writes a letter. Because when you're writing a letter on death row, you write about what matters most to people who really matter. That's what he's doing. Wouldn't you? It's interesting, because he, he writes a letter, and it's not a poem, it's not historical fiction, okay? It's not another form of literature. Think about a letter. A letter is inherently relational, more than other forms of literature, isn't it? Yeah, you, you can write a historical fiction, but a letter is written from a person to another known person or persons. It's incredibly relational. And what we're doing today is we're opening somebody else's mail. That's what we're doing. Sneaky. <laughs> and because it's a letter, it's highly relational, and at the beginning of that type of literature, we better be asking ourselves, what's the relationship like between who wrote it and to whom he wrote? That's what I want to know at the beginning of the letter, because that's the type of literature it is. It's not prophecy, it's not histor history. And that, that's what I want to do today. So I want to ask, what's the nature of this relationship? And then, then, once I understand the nature of that relationship a few thousand years ago, I want to ask then, what are lessons we can learn for our relationships today? That's where we're headed in this book. What clues would we have to knowing what kind of relationship is here? All right, you got your study. Are you open to it? It's right here. Maybe you already did your Saturday soak and you know the answers. You already know, good. Maybe you didn't, but we're gonna look. Let's, in the actual text, what clues do we have here? And here's what you could do. So I'm just illustrating, I'm not telling you have to do this, but here's something you could do. Let's see if we can read this. I can't, I'm blind as a bat, but I've got this picture of, of a word that you could circle up here on the screen. Let's throw it up there. Here's a picture, and you could circle two words here. Uh, I see him describe the relationship right here, this word partnership in the gospel. And then you could also circle another word later in verse seven, partakers with me of grace. You could circle both of those as you're studying. Aren't, that's a descriptive word of a relationship, isn't it? That's the, of all the words that he could use, that's the word he chose. How do I, Paul, relate to you, the people of Philippi? We are Partners, partners. And if you wanted to, you could read that in a couple different English translations, and you'd see that it's translated different ways, which gives you a clue that this is probably a hard Greek word to translate. You could even do a little study if you wanted to go really nerdy, and you could look this up in a concordance. You could see where it's used with, throughout the Bible, or you could do a word study. And you might find this with a good study Bible even, in the study notes. You might find that that word partnership and the word partakers is the same word. It's the same word in Greek. One's just the verbal form. And then you might say, okay, that's important. I'm gonna start studying that. 
And, and you'd see it's this Greek word koinonia. Maybe you've heard that if you've come to church a bunch, bunch. Koinonia. And you'd look at a concordance and you'd try and figure out, okay, where else does this occur in the Bible? Because I, I want to know this question. If Paul describes his relationship with this church in Philippi as partners, whatever this word is, it's this partnership, partaker, does this relationship apply to me? That's what I want to know. Before I can jump to application, I got to know, is this relevant to me or not? Is this a unique word only describing an apostle in the first century with this particular church? Or is this a word that's used to describe other kinds of relationships in the New Testament? And so you could, you could look up a concordance, you could go to a bunch of places, but here's where I'd go. I'd go to 1 John. 1 John. And I'd see that exact same word used in 1 John. It says this in 1 John. So John's writing, he says, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too, this is the gospel, by the way, that he's proclaiming, so that you too may have, and then there's that word. Here it's translated fellowship. Fellowship with us. Okay, so this is John, and it's with some different people, and he's saying we've got this same word, koinonia, together. But then he goes further, and he uses that exact same word to describe a different relationship. We've got koinonia together, and indeed our koinonia, fellowship, is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Whoa. And I'm going, this is getting used in some different ways. This can't just be Paul and some church in Philippi. This word is being used to describe Christians and their koinonia with God. Oh, now this must apply to me. This isn't just relevant to Paul and Philippi. This has got to be, and then you go even further, you could go to Acts 2. I'm not going to read this whole section, but here we are. PowerPoint, faux pas, never do that, but there's all the words. And uh, Acts 2, you can read it later, 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the koinonia, fellowship. And if you want to know what that Greek word means, that's the best definition in the Bible. It describes it. They're, they're selling stuff. Can you imagine, like, joining a church and somebody goes, hey, I'm homeless. And someone else goes, I'll sell my house. And I'll bring it to the pastors. And I'll go, here's a half a million dollars. Take it. And I trust you to do what's best. Koinonia. Whoa. That's radical. And that's the word that Paul uses to describe. The re I'm, koinonia, why am I using that? It's just because there's not really a good English word for it. We don't have a good English word. So I don't know how to define it. Koinonia, that's what it means. Th th there's a sense that it's um, partnership, sure, yes. Like co-labors, yeah, we're working together towards something. Friendship, yeah, but in English, it's deeper. Uh, um, sharers, partakers, ugh, English. Struggle to find a good word. So here's my best shot. I'm going to use Paul's word. Just, let's just call it partners. That's what he uses, at least in the ESV. Partners. Partners. What is this relationship between Paul and these people in Philippi? He describes himself as partners. Here's my stab at a definition of what koinonia actually is. What is koinonia? It's this act of sharing in common purposes and sharing in common privileges of an incredibly intimate, close community, unlike anything you've ever experienced. Closer than family, closer than friends. It's close. That's my definition. And now he's going to unpack this in the opening of his letter and describe this relationship. Okay, I've got words circled. I'm on my way to my Bible study. I'm figuring out what's the main idea of this text. He's used it twice. He's describing a relationship. How does he do it? How does he describe it? I'm going to read this whole section, and I might break it up this way. So here's another slide. Maybe, maybe you look for, like, themes and main ideas. And so then I would go from three through eight, and I'd put brackets on it. And I'd label it, because the beginning of three says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all. And I'd, I'd circle thank, 
and I'd create a bracket, and then I'd look at the next section, and I'd put a bracket there because that says uh, my prayer for you. So I'd circle prayer. I'd say, okay, he's doing two things. He's doing two things. He is praising God for their partnership in the gospel, and he's praying for these partners in the gospel. Praise and a prayer. You could argue it's all a prayer, but it's like the beginning's a prayer of praise towards God. There's an outline. All right, so you're starting to unpack it. I want to describe this relationship, and he does it in two ways, and that's the whole message. Partners in the gospel give reason for praise, and partners in the gospel give reason for prayer. How does Paul describe this partnership in the gospel and why would he start the letter the way that he does? Remember, he's on death row. What kind of letter would you write from jail? I got a suspicion your opening words don't sound like this. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy on death row. That's not a letter I'd write. Not on death row, not in prison. Why, Paul? Why is Philippians the happiest letter in the New Testament? From prison. That's what I wanna know. I'm bothered by that. He actually gives reasons. And he gives three of them. So as you're looking at the text, he uses that word because. Do you see the word because in verse five? You could underline that. And the author's signaling, he's saying, here's some reasons. Here's my thesis. Praise to God for your partnership. I'm joyful. And here are three reasons. Three reasons that Paul praises God for his partners in Philippi. First, Paul praises God with joy because of their shared purpose. Shared purpose. See it in the text with me. I put a little number one at verse five. Here's the first reason. Because of, here, I'm making my prayer with joy. So that's the feeling he has. He's praising God with joy because of their shared purpose. Look at that phrase, partnership, not just partnership in general. What are they partners in? in the gospel from the first day until now. Remember Paul, he, he, he goes to Philippi, he's led by the, the Spirit, some believers come to faith. You got Lydia, who's making purple clothes and selling them. You got a slave girl. <laughs> Paul's imprisoned in Philippi, the other time that he was in prison, <laughs> and he's freed miraculously, and the flipping jailer comes to faith, right? From the first day is not some abstract term. He's saying from 10 years ago when I was in your city and I shared the gospel and you came to faith, we in that day became partners in the gospel because you and I believed. And you've continued for a decade in that partnership. Thick and thin. You've, you've been with me. You've been consistent, not just in that, oh, you believe and I believe and I'll go on with my life. No, no, no. Lydia says, this gospel's so good, Paul. We want to send you out to share it with more people. Your purpose is now our purpose. Koinonia. Shared. Whatever I lived for before, Paul, this gospel's so good, I live for it with you. That's a reason Paul can rejoice. They, he has joy because they have a shared koinonia mission. That's what he means when he says we're partners in the gospel. You don't just send me financial support. You're, you're backing this effort and purpose. There's a second reason. He praises God with joy because of their shared purpose. He praises God with confidence because of their shared power. Look at the next reason. And it's, it's nice. The verses follow in line. Look at verse six. There's a second reason. Here's the reason I'm praising. Paul says, I'm sure of this. Do you see his confidence? That's what that phrase means. I'm absolutely, take it to the bank, confident of what? That he who began a good work in you will bring it 
to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Paul praises God because, with confidence because of their shared power. Paul is hundreds of miles away from these people. He will never see them again. He's going to get martyred. He's in jail. Getting a letter to them, there's no email, okay? He doesn't write a letter and it doesn't make that cool whoosh sound when you hit the button, okay? Epaphroditus has to like risk his life to carry it, okay? How are you sure, Paul? How are you confident that what you started in these people will be completed in the very end? Can't be him. That's not the grounds of his confidence. He's not like, you know, I'm a great preacher. I'm really good at writing letters, and I'm going to keep your faith going from 100 miles away. It's not in Lydia. He's not going, hey, girl, you go. Hold the church together. My confidence is in you. Sell some more purple clothes. What's the grounds of his confidence? How can he be so sure that the faith that started 10 years ago will be there at the very end of the day of judgment? Look at the grounds, and then I would underline it, and I would say, yes, glorious, wow, yes. He who began a good work will bring it to completion. That's God. Paul praises God because he believes in a big, sovereign God. And if this God Not Paul. If this God was behind their faith on the first day, that same powerful sovereign God will be behind their faith on the last day. That's his confidence. That's a reason to rejoice. Can you put yourself in Paul's shoes? He loves these people. He risked his life for these people, and now he's going to die in jail, and he really wants the best for them, but he praises God. He knows. It's not up to me. I could get hit by a bus through our big parking lot because there's no safety medians after this sermon and I could have confidence that what God started at life point, he will bring to completion in the last day, not because of me. It ain't because of my preaching. <laughs> it's because what God started in you, he will finish. That's a reason to praise God. Even from a prison cell, Paul praises God with joy because of their shared purpose. He praises God with confidence because of their shared power, God himself. That's why it's a capital P. And there's a third reason. Verse three, he praises God with affection because of their shared grace. Look at this language. This is lovey-dovey language. Verse three, it's almost, like, it's almost like Paul was writing, and he was like, maybe I came on too strong. <laughs> it was like a little much with all that joy language. So he says, no, 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 let me defend my language. It is right for me to feel this way about you. And then at verse 8, he's defending his feelings even more. He's like, go ask God. God will testify how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. This is lovey-dovey language. It's intense. In the Yarbrough household, I don't know how this started, but uh, with our kids, over the past couple years, our four and five-year-old, we'll say things like this. We'll look at Penny just randomly, and we'll go, hey, Penny, guess what? I love you more than cupcakes. And Penny will giggle. And then Penny will look back at mom and dad, and she'll go, I love you more than princesses. Okay, and and what are we doing? We're we're saying, I I can't describe how much I feel for you, so I'm going to take cupcakes, something really awesome, and I'm going to say, my love for you is better than cupcakes. But Paul goes beyond cupcakes. He goes to the very top. And Paul says, I yearn for you, not just like cupcake love. I yearn for you with the affection of Jesus. I can't, he, and notice, he doesn't say more, because he couldn't. There's no way Paul could say, I love you more than Jesus. So he just says, it's like I love you 
with the affection of Jesus. My heart beats for you the way Jesus beats for you. Serious love. That's a reason to praise. Now, Paul has this incredible affection. Why? What's the grounds of that kind of love and cupcake love affection? He says this. Look at the phrase. Partakers slash partners slash sharers slash friendship slash family. Koinonia, whatever that is. You're partakers with me, this time not in the gospel. You're partakers with me, what? Of grace. That's the phrase you circled. Verse 7. What's he saying? He, he's saying, look, you've been partners with me, partakers with me of grace from the beginning to the end, but also through thick and thin. He says, both in my imprisonment and my defense and confirmation of the gospel, the NIV uses the word whether imprisoned or free to preach. He's making a contrast and he's saying, look, in all circumstances, you're a sharer with me. This is particularly remarkable in the ancient world because Paul even alludes later in the, later in the letter that others have abandoned Paul. And, and the reason is to be imprisoned over and over and to claim you're a pretty good guy and your aim is love would be a, a source of great shame, wouldn't it? Think about it. If you're a new group of Christians in a Roman colony, and people on the street are asking you, like, hey, so tell me about this thing, Christianity. And you go, well, our Savior, he was, a, he was on trial and proven guilty, sort of. Not really proven, but they said he was guilty, and then they killed him on a cross, naked. And then the guy who planted our church, he's also in prison a lot, like all the time. More often than not, he's in prison. What, wouldn't you naturally distance yourself? Do you see the source of shame that is? And some churches did that. They said, oh, this Paul guy. Not Philippi. Through thick and thin, whether in chains or free, they are partakers of grace. How could they press through that source of shame and stick with him for 10 years? And I think the answer is right there in the phrase. Partakers of grace. These people in Philippi go, look, you and me, Paul, we're not that different. We are both beggars before God, undeserving, and have been lavished upon with his grace. I'm not ashamed of anything. We're certainly not ashamed of your imprisonment. We're both, we're flat, we're level ground, partakers of this grace together. And Paul gives praise. He praises God with joy because of their shared purpose. He praises God with confidence because of their shared power. He praises God with affection because of their shared grace. Koinonia. Is that how you describe your relationships with Christians today? I, I want you to think of people Christians, people in the church right here. You should think about your leaders, your elders, other Christians, friends, family. Could you write this letter from prison to them? Is this a descriptive nature of your relationship in Christian community? Koinonia. We, we're called to this with God and with one another. Acts 2, this is how the church should be. Do you, with others, have affection for Christians? Real, deep, cupcake love affection for other Christians such that you go, you and me, brother, common grace. We're both beggars. So there's no place for pride or judgment between you and I. That will not get in the way. I will never be ashamed of you when you stumble because we're both beggars. Does that describe your Christian relationships? Do you have a confidence in your brothers because of a common power? Your sister trips up and offends you, and you just want to take up the gavel. But then you remember, no, 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 no. 
what God started in her, he will finish. God's at work in you. I'm confident of that. I won't condemn you. I'll, I'll endure with you with confidence. Does this describe your relationships? Do your relationships, and man, I want to underline this one as much as I can. Do you have friendships in the gospel with a shared purpose? Is the highest aim of Christian community your comfort so that you're not lonely? That's a good aim. Community's good. But community that ends there is for me. But community that has a greater purpose. It's, we're on mission together. So Paul, as much as I'd love for you to still be in my life group, because you make the decaf coffee better than Betty. And I wish you'd come back to Philippi. No, 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 the Philippians can say, yes, go to jail and die for the sake of the gospel. Because we're partners in it. This is radical. This is koinonia. Does this describe our relationships in the church? This is Paul's relationship. He's writing a letter. And this is how he describes his partners. But he doesn't just give praise to God. He also sends one big compound sentence long prayer for them. And this is the final point, Paul's prayer. Look at it with me. I made the brackets. Verse nine starts the prayer. This is like a thesis statement. Paul's trying to say, look here as I die soon on death row, this is my prayer for you. He says this. It is my prayer that your love, and you could underline love, that's agape, that's the, the big Christian Point. What's the whole law summarized? Love God and love people. Deuteronomy 6 and Matthew 22. Paul gives three results of this abounding love, very briefly. And I, I put results, I don't know, you could do this. I put little arrows every time there's a word so, right? He's saying a reason. So I'm praying that your love would abound with knowledge and discernment. Verse 10, so that. And then again, halfway through, so and then verse 11, two. These are three results. He wants their love to grow. And he wants it to be a knowledgeable and discerning love so that the first result is that you may approve what is excellent. He's saying, look, young church that's only been around for 10 years, grow up and mature in a discerning, wise love. Not young, immature, puppy love that makes all kinds of mistakes. Have a discerning, wise love that you can make good choices for those next to you. You can steward well resources before you give a generous gift to, to maximize it towards that person. You're thinking about maximum love. I'm going to approve what's most excellent. This is a mature kind of love. That's how it grows. Another result, though, is that you would be filled with the fruit of righteousness and so be pure and blameless. We'll come back to this theme later, but I want to highlight, man, there's so much here. There's so much good stuff. Pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. How does that come about? I would circle and put a smiley face next to the last phrase of verse 11. Through Jesus Christ. That... <laughs> Gives me so much hope. You're getting another sermon on this. It's coming. Uh, Philippians 2, 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This, this verse, though, it's right there. <laughs> How does that fruit come about? Yes, work. Yes, love. Do effort. But it's God who's behind that fruit. It's through Jesus Christ that you're filled with the fruit of righteousness. That gives me such hope. Man, what a, what a prayer. And then finally, the last result is to the glory and praise of God. That's the final, ultimate point of Paul's prayer for these people is that God would be glorified. Uh, here's what I want to highlight by way of application and prayer. Paul has just said that he is ridiculously sure and confident 
that what God started in them, he will complete. And then he prays to God, please complete what you started. That's weird. You just said you're super confident, unwavering from prison. Yes, God will finish what he started in you. Why would you even pray for that? And you see for Paul, his confidence in the sovereignty of God is not in opposition to prayer. Why? He's so confident that God will do this, but he knows that God uses your prayers as a means to accomplish the purpose he will. So he prays. I know you'll do it, God, and God, please do it. Please do it. Is this how you pray? Is this how you pray for one another? Lead, fellow leaders, elders, shepherds, how do you pray for the flock? Does this inform our prayers on Tuesday nights? Look, we're, we're reading through the prayer list, and I, all these are good petitions. It's good to ask God for health. It's good to ask God about an upcoming procedure. It, it's good to, to present our needs. We are commanded to do that over and over. But I, I see Paul. Paul could have asked for a prayer to get out of prison. That seems reasonable to me. But this is his prayer, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Is this how we pray for one another? This is the prayer of gospel partners. In the opening of Philippians, Paul writes a letter. What kind of letter would you write from jail? On death row. What kind of letter would you write? Who would you write to? I, I'm praying for you in the room, for you online, that this could be your prayer. That your love would grow in such a way that if you ever found yourself in jail, this is the kind of letter you might write to people at life point. That, I'm praying that's the kind of partnership you'd have. You'd write the happiest letter of your life in a prison cell, and the people you'd write to would be in this room. I thank my God every time I think of you, life point. I, I'm praying that this would be the theme of every global, not missionary, do you know what we call them here? It's kind of branding, but I think it's good. Partners! Partners. That's why we don't call them missionaries. It's this word. Global partners. I'm praying Janet Brown from Tokyo in Japan could write this letter of LifePoint. Dear LifePoint Church, at the end of my 30-year career in Japan, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. This is, this is our prayer for our church that we would have this kind of fellowship, this kind of partnership to the glory and praise of God. What kind of letter would you write from jail and who would you write it to? I charge us by way of application as a final note. Seek these relationships. Please. Life is far sweeter with these kinds of partnerships. If you have them, nurture them, endure. If you don't have them, make it your summer goal. I will barbecue my guts out until I have partners in the gospel, in my home, so that we could achieve this great purpose and have this kind of fellowship as a church. Let's pray together. Jesus, I'm, I'm charging us that we would grow in your grace, we grow in the gospel and we grow in love so that Life Point Church would be marked by this kind of community. Father, please, for the sake of your name, grow us into the kind of community that shares a otherworldly bond. I pray that Northern Colorado would look at Life Point 
with, with a lifted eyebrow. Who are these people? Why would they live this kind of way? I pray that our, our, our community and our fellowship would, would bring a sweet witness of the kind of relationships we could have that they'd be marked by joy, they'd be marked by growing love and affection for one another because of your grace that you've given to us. So may it be so. By your spirit, Lord, and through this summer, do a great work through this book. For the sake of your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Zach. Let's stand one last time as we finish with this final song. Sing with joy, sing he's worthy. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever see he's worthy he's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you sing holy holy there is no one like For next week, read Philippians 1, 12 through 18. Mark it up, study it, soak in it on Saturday. 
Let's come ready for what God has in his word. Here's our blessing today as we close. It comes from Romans 15, verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together, like koinonia together, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you this week.